Good. <laughs> and good. All right, so I guess we'll start off here talking about the what, test four, has some of the virus um, questions on it. See what you guys know. Okay. What is not a way we classify viruses? D, presence of organelles, right? Because what viruses, by the very nature, do not have organelles. So we won't use that as a means of uh, differentiation. Okay, creation of new nucleic acids and viral proteins and their components is? What? Maturation. Not maturation. Maturation is going to be the assembly of those. Synthesis, synthesis. So maturation is when we take all those parts and assemble them into, uh, you know, viruses. The synthesis is when we make those components. Is this yes. Okay. Generally speaking, naked viruses are hardier or more stable in the environment than envelope viruses. True. What through return do you apply to viruses? Obligate intercellular parasites. It's not obligate intercellular pirates. Uh, no, that's the wrong. That's the wrong one. Obligate intercellular parasites. And if you can explain those three terms, how? Why? Why are they obligate? They they require a cell to go into. Okay, intercellular. They go inside cells to do that. And parasites. They really don't contribute much. Okay. Number nine, why is there a drive to negative sense RNA in all viruses, no matter the initial nucleic acid type? Are you sure? Actually, I'm, uh, this is a, it should, a should be a drive to positive sense RNA. That was a, an old test question I actually had to change around. So the question's incorrect. The drive is to positive sense RNA. So it's, you have to know that it's a drive to positive sense RNA. Um, and you have that, if I did put that question back in, it would be uh, correct. Um, small caps and mirror subunits combined to make up capsids of viruses. Caps and mirrors make up a capsid, or do capsids make up a caps and mirror? True or false? True, true. Cap the small subunits are caps and mirrors that make up a capsid. Okay. Okay, infection by a uh, phage of what bacterium is needed for this bacterium called scarlet fever? I mentioned this somewhat in passing. Staphylococcus pyrogenes, it causes strep throat. If you don't treat it, can uh, do that. And what, what was that uh, process called? Well, it was Streptococcus pyrogenes, E. But overall, what was that process called that a bacterium becomes more virulent? by the action of a bacteriophage integrating into it. What was that whole process called? Not transduction. Transduction is the movement of DNA. Transduction is the horizontal movement of DNA from one bacterium to another bacterium via a medium of a bacteriophage. Good guess. Good, good try. But, um, what was the overall concept that we said that a bacteriophage can affect a bacterium and sort of prophage and make that bacterium into a more pathogenic form? Degenic shift? Not less, no, no. And a genetic shift is making the virus outer part changes. Okay, so when, when a virus integrates into a bacteriophage, we call that lyso what? Lyso, lysogenic. Okay, so the first part is lysogenic. The bacteriophage is getting into the genome of the bacterium. And what's it doing? It's changing or converting, possibly. It's converting it into a more pathogenic form. So the second part is lysogenic what? 
conversion. Exactly. That's what I was saying. A little about biology, you have to be a plumber, you have to be a mover, you have to be a psychologist, you have to do everything in this profession. Okay, so lysogenic conversion. Okay. Lots of um, bacteria are made more pathogenic because of this action. So um, Streptococcus pyrogenes is just one example. E. coli is another one. Cholera, another example. Okay. All right. The genetic material, okay, I believe this is number four here. The genetic material of a bacteriophage incorporated into the genome of a bacterium. And when I gave this question before, I had to draw this on the board to clarify it. So here we have our bacterium. Here we have our chromosome, okay? And right here we have our bacteriophage. What do we call that bacteriophage that is integrated into the chromosome of the bacterium? Very specific name. Prophage, correct. Prophage. Okay. What do we call the phage that can do this? So here is a bacteriophage outside of a bacterium, and it has the ability to undergo this lysogenic cycle. We had a very specific name for that one. Not integrated into it, but a bacteriophage that can do this lysogenic cycle. Again, the word begin with T. It's not, it's not on here. I'm just pulling it. I'm just making another question from that one. Okay, so the question's not on, the, on this. It's just the, a bacteriophage that can undergo the lysogenic pathway. Temperate. Temperate phage, that is correct. Temperate phage. Okay. Now, let's just say this phage, this prophage, what would make a prophage want to come out? Yeah, some type of stress, UV light, mutagen, some type of stress want to come out. What's the process when this prophage pulls itself out to make more viruses? We call this a specific name when that prophage comes out. Induction, correct. Induction. Okay. Virus that is similar to Ebola in the same family has about 25% fatality. Marburg, correct. I, I don't recall the let me um, let me scroll up some. I don't recall the number. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven. Okay. Phages that can undergo lysogenic. Replication, temperate phages. So phages that can undergo lysogenic replication are temperate phages. Okay. Zones of clearing produced by bacteriophages on a lawn of bacteria. We thought this was from them, quote unquote, eating it, but we had a specific name for those zones of clearing made on a plate. Inhibition. That inhibition, those zones of inhibition, that's from antibiotics. This was on the plate where there's little zones of clearing. Plaques. Plaques. Okay. When we just asked about induction, the process by which a virus moves itself from being integrated in a genome and starts making viruses for release. Induction. Okay. How many more we got here? Okay. Here we go. Describe the principle of lysogenic conversion. Okay, short answer. Describe the principle of lysogenic conversion. Name exa one example in a specific bacterium. 
What's what is lysogenic conversion? What's what's happening? In lysogenic conversion. What's happening? What? Correct by the what? Integration of a virus. Exactly. Prophage gets in there. It becomes a prophage. It introduces something to the bacterium. Turns something on. Makes it more pathogenic. You can name uh, Streptococcus pyrogenes here. You could name E. coli in a, in a situation. Uh, for cholera, you can, you can use cholera as an example. Lots of human pathogens are made worse or significantly worse by the uh, effect of a bacteriophage. Okay. Describe the proto-oncogene theory. Use the diagram below to explain how virus can initiate cancer. What, based on this theory, what has to happen? What ha and then and one, one caveat about this. It shows like the repressor is really close by. The repressor doesn't have to be like right next to it. It's just for illustrative purposes. Okay. So what is the proto gene theory? What is it? What is it? What's the postulate? What, is it, what does it suggest? Provi well, viruses promote, but a little bit more um, macro than that. A little bit more... Overall, what, do, what does this tell us? What, what do we go, what does the theory think, well, excuse me, what does the theory tell us or suggest? Viruses do what? Cause, cause cancer. Viruses can be a cause of cancer. Okay, um, how, how does this work? How does the proto gene theorem work? Virus into? Promoter. promoter. Where would it put the promoter? The uh, correct. Okay, and that would make it into an active oncogene. Then what's the next thing here? What would have to also happen? It would have to somehow insert in the middle of the repressor, cause them like a frame shift mutation, essentially turning off the repressor. And the proto oncogene, well, what would be the oncogene at that point would no longer be repressed, and then cancer would result. Now, this is an oversimplified thing. There's more than one proto oncogene. Um, Per cell, so this this shows like one to one. It's a lot more complex than what's being shown here. But take home point: viruses can integrate into our genome, right? Viruses can enter our genome. They can turn things on, turn things off, and induce cancer. At least that's the, the theorem to it. Okay, what is transduction? Name and describe two forms of this phenomena. What is transduction? You guys tell me. What's transduction? Yeah, in a, in a sense, yes. Um, kind of, but a little bit. It's, it's more like a, gen, it's a horizontal gene transfer, essentially, between two bacteria, using a bacteriophage as a, as a conduit. Okay, and what are the two forms of this phenomena? No, no, horizontal is transduction. So that, that is that, but we had two specific types of transduction. Specialized and generalized. Okay, so you guys tell me about specialized. What, what, what happens in specialized transduction? Correct. Correct. So the, bac the bacteriophage, when it does induction, it pulls itself out. When the prophage pulls itself out, it's going to take a little chunk of the adjacent bacterial DNA along for the ride. Okay. When it pulls that little chunk out, all of the uh, phages made will have a piece of that bacterial DNA in it. Then what happens? So it's just not that, but okay, what's the next step? The virus releases, right? And then what does that... What happens next? When it goes into the next bacteria. Mm -hmm. What does it do then? It replicates. It, not replicates. What's it going to do? If, if it's a lysogenic... It goes into that chromosome. Correct. It goes into the next bacterial chromosome, inserts another piece of bacterial DNA into the bacteria it's going into. Okay. 
about special uh, generalized? What's generalized transduction? Mm -hmm. uh, DNA. Right. Gets, essentially gets into the correct, correct. So kind of like a happy accident, if you will, that a chunk of bacterial DNA random gets into the, bacter the uh, virus being made. Okay, so the virus then goes into another bacterium and it integrates into the genome and now it's also going to integrate that bacterial DNA into the genome. So end results um, similar, uh, but how it happens is uh, a little bit different. Okay. All right. That was that test. Okay, any questions on viruses? So we've talked about viruses a lot, right? If I ask you some questions about viruses, would you know them? Can we just throw some questions out about specific viruses? Okay. Riddle me this, riddle me that. Um, gosh. Virus that um, okay. Let me ask you this: incident rates of um, rubella in the United States. What are they like now? Are they high or low? Rubella. We talked a little bit about this. Well, actually, a little, more than a little bit. Incident rates now of rubella. German measles. They're incredibly low. Okay, they're like five to ten cases a year. Okay. Uh, let me think of another pathogen. Um, okay, this pathogen um, causes it's a it's, um, causes spontaneous abortions in females. It can cause it's found in cats. Um, possible link to bipolar disorders and depression. What pathogen am I thinking? This is why females are told not to change cat litter. Gondii, correct. That's toxoplasma gondii. Um, kind of an interesting one. Uh, in the, hmm? Toxoplasma gondii. Okay, what would be a pathogen that would get into the eyes carried via a fly vector? Here you have to actually cut the conjunctiva of the eye to pull the worm out. It doesn't really cause blindness. You'd think it would cause blindness, but not really if you get the thing out. What is it? It's a dual name. Two names of the same type. Loa Loa. Okay. Think of another one here. Um, Okay, the fiery serpent, it's a, a worm that's, you know, uh, 300 to 500 centimeters uh, in length. It gets in, you have to pull it out, it, part of it will come out, and you have to sit and twist it, possibly the origin of the medical symbol. There's a little bit of debate on that. But the medical symbol at the staff, they thought that that was possibly the stick you would pull the worm out. Of course, we don't have a time machine. We can't go back and confirm that, but that's a, a suggestion. What, what pathogen am I thinking about? You pull this out, and it can release all of its enzymes, cause necrosis of tissue, and, and, a, and a fair amount of pain. So that's why you want to pull it out inch by inch by inch. <laughs> Mendelus. You got it. You got it. Draconis Mendelus. Bless you. Okay, um, how about the fungus that causes yeast infections? Also in used, seen as the cause of thrush. Candida, Candida albicans. Or Candida would also work um, in this regard. Okay, hmm. What do we, what term do we describe to a fungal genome in which it has two separate genomes but they're not intermingled? So with humans, we would say we are diploid, right? Half of our mother, half of our father is intermixed in one nucleus. 
right? Haploid, you have one nucleus, but it's just one set of instructions. Fungus can have two sets of instructions, but they're not intermixed. What term do we use to, the, to describe this? We also said that for diploid, we would say we are 2N. For haploid, we would say N. Here, we made the point of saying N plus N. What's the N plus N refer to? Dikaryotic, correct. Do fungus ever fuse and become a diploid? They do, but not for long. I mean, it's, it's part of the life cycle, but it's, it's not like us where we're you know, all diploid. Well, except for comedic tissue, of course. Um, okay. Hmm. Let me look at the, vi the fungus parts here. Okay, that's a good question. Differences between fungus and bacteria. Can you name a couple differences between fungus and bacteria? Fungus have organelles. I'm sorry? Fungus have organelles. Fungus have organelles, exactly. A little bit more than that. They're organelles and they're also eukaryotic, right? So they're eukaryotic organelles. Okay, what else? They're organelles. What's some, what's some, same, some similarities and some differences? Okay. Bacteria do not have organelles, fungus do. What's the similarity? In what regard are they similar? Are they, regard, are they similar in any way? I don't think we specifically said it. We talked about some features of fungus, and you've probably seen this in uh, bacteria also. Something the bacteria have that fungus also have. Cell wall. Yes, cell wall. And what's a cell wall made of in fungus? Chitin, correct. Okay. What are some differences? Okay, we've got some similarities. What are some differences? So we've got organelles, correct. How about uh, photosynthetic ability? Certain bacteria can do photosynthesis. Fungus can not. Let me just go to the differences here. Fungus are larger, right? Eukaryotic cells. They have to have organelles. They are, of course, larger. Okay. Okay, and that last one. Different antimicrobial agents are used. Why? Why are different antimicrobials used? Why can't we use erythromycin against a fungal infection? They're, they're so similar, exactly. Genetically, uh, on a cellular level, they're much closer to us than a bacteria. Their ribosomes are like more like our ribosomes. You know, they don't have like gyrase, so they, they don't have a lot of the attack points that a bacterium would. Okay. Okay. Um. Uh, yes. I'm sorry. It means, yeah, sedimentation. Uh, the exact number? You mean what? Yeah. Sorry. Like, is it like eukaryotes? Correct. 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 So it's, it's just like it's just like ours, the sedimentation rate, or CVAGs. I, 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 I swish, sw uh, Swedish name, I believe, and I cannot pronounce the name. It's sw Swiberg, I believe is how it's pronounced. I, it's, it's, a, it's a scientist's last name who did work in that area. But that's what the S stands for. Technically, the S doesn't stand for sedimentation. It, it defines the sedimentation rate, but it's actually the S is a, named after a scientist. Um, anyhow. Um, but anyhow. Uh, all right. And when they do it, they actually put it like in a swing bucket rotor, and they'll spin it, and they'll measure the time it takes to move from one area to the next area. So that's the, the point. All right. So um, are, fire, are fungus motile or non-motile? None, but what's the exception? What's the exception to the fungus that is motile? Which fungus can have a motility phase as part of their life cycle? Chytrids. Chytrids. How do, how, do virus, excuse me, how do fungus digest their food? 
by putting out their enzymes, exactly. They release the enzymes, they break down food outside, and they absorb the nutrients. Okay. Okay. And that, that part we talked about, that's saprophobes or saprophytic. Um, okay. Can, virus, can fungus be parasitic? Yes, they can be. And think about humans, for example. There's some one we talked about with a nematode where it forms a ring around it and pinches it off. So yeah, fungus can be parasitic. Most are not. Most are going to be symbiotic relationship, you know, not hurt anyone. But in certain cases, yes, fungus can surely be path or um, um, uh, parasitic. Okay. What's a single cell fungus? Yeast. True yeast. Well. Yes and no. I mean, you can have dimorphics where they become a single cell and multi-celled, but a true yeast will always be a yeast no matter the condition. So a um, little bit different there. Um, certain things might not be a true yeast, but they might be a yeast in certain situations. So, um, But yeast would be the... But if you put true yeast on a test, I wouldn't take off for that, really. It's a minor point. All right. Oh, this is the point I would ask probably. Uh, fungus. Okay. Uh, what what fungus is attacking amphibian populations, particularly in South America? Maybe not the full name of it, but um, perhaps what group would we define this in? Attacking amphibians in South America. Uh, I mentioned I'm doing a little bit of testing for this here. Well, I'm not. I'm doing the the lab work. Someone else went and did the swab work um, for it. But what what am I thinking about? BDR or what group of fungus? I I take BDR. Kittreds, uh, kittreds, kittreds. But you're you're correct. BD. All right. We talk about zygomyces, right? Right. We talked about different areas. You can get it in what? In your nose, right? Causes inflammation. It, a lot of people aren't affected by it if they'll, they're exposed to it. It's not. It doesn't go to this full blown thing where you have to take someone's eyes and nose out, but it can. Okay, it can do cutaneous also. Okay. Which group of fungus are the most common in terms of uh, pathogens? Sac fungus, Escomyces, either way. Okay, for these, the candida, yeah, you got to know we talked about that later on. I'm just making the point that we get, there's both positives and negatives with this group of fungus. Okay, so uh, do you have to memorize every single one of these? No, but I'm just making the point that you know, so much of things that we deal with every day come back to this group of fungus. Okay. okay. Okay, we talked a little bit about cordyceps. That, that's the one that gets in the plant, the insect's heads, and it um, will make them go insane, right? That one you should probably know. Um, if you play video games, it was the basis for a video game, actually, where it was attacking humans. Um, actually, a very popular video game. Um, anyhow, so what happens with this one? Fungus gets in the ant's head, right? Ants go crazy. They go, and they climb up, and then the fruiting body, they, they, they latch onto the high above, and they die, and then the, virus, the fungus starts growing, and it comes out the brain, and... Um, releases the spores down below and then infects the entire colony. So all right. All right, all right. Yeah. Okay. All right, we talked about symbiotic fungus, right? What are lichens? Lichens are 
What? How would you describe a lichen? If I said, here's, instead of doing fill in the blank, I had a word that said lichen. Tell me about it. What is it? Trees, right, and a little bit more. So what kind of cells make up a lichen? If you could look at it under a microscope, what would you see? It's a combination of what? So it's going gonna, it's gonna to be fungus and photosynthetic cells. Okay, It's not like the... the um, uh, endophytes, endophytes are actually going to like drill into the root. Okay, so not that way. It's just a, a, a almost like a matrix or a mishmash of fungus and photosynthetic cells. Okay. And you have to know if it's between a sac fungus or a club fungus. No, just know it's between fungal cells and some cells that can do photosynthesis. Photosynthesis. All right. Okay, endophytic, this is actually going to enter into the plant. Mycorrhizae or mycorrhiza, um, this is the fungus that's in a close association with what? Roots. Okay. So if I had some fill in the blank here, I would say something like that uh, combination of fungal cells and photosynthetic cells, these inhabit harsh environments, they reproduce by fragmentation. What am I describing? Lichens. This is found in association with roots. It helps to increase plant growth. Mycorrhiza. Rhizae. Okay. It's a plasma. Where are we going to find this one? Where do you find this one? Hmm? High nitrogen environments where there's droppings, like, um,. Ooh, what are we talking about? Uh, bats, caves, guana, um, chicken houses, places like that. Where are we going to find Intracytosine uh, Benuzii? What? What? Where would you? Where would you think you'd see this? What kind of person? What would if you if you were a physician, you saw this? someone had this, what would you automatically start thinking about? HIV. It's very common to see. When you see this in someone, almost always it's um, someone who has HIV. I'm sure there's been a situation where there's one person that did not have it, but pretty common to see this with HIV patients. How does it work? Let me go past here. How does, it, how does the, how does the uh, Benuzii work? What does it do? Where do you find it? Intestines. Intestines, okay. And, and how does it, what, what, what does it have in it that comes out? Like a coil, right? And it's spring-loaded and it comes out and it sits in between the villi. Okay, and it uses that as a conduit for nutrients. So if you go back to this picture, it's going to use that as a, as a conduit to move nutrients into the fungus. But really, really common to see this in people with HIV. Um, uh, gosh, I think it was identified in 1985 in someone with HIV. Okay. Calvisus purpurea. This one is kind of an interesting one. Um, a little bit of, you know, who done it type of things. But this can actually cause hallucinations. If now we actually think there's some benefits to this fungus also, but this one can cause hallucinations. There's a theory that goes that the Salem witch trials were, as, were caused by uh, an infection of this in the grain in that colony. 
Okay, what happened? So what Salem Witch Trials, what happened during those trials? But yeah, they were, you know, women were, people were acting crazy, right? They were possessed, they were talking in tongues, and obviously they thought that, you know, it was witchcraft. Um, but after the infection, then they were fine. Okay, so what do we do with them? We, we treat them? No, no, of course not. We burn them at the stake. But there is a suggestion that uh, an infection of this fungus caused it. Do we know that? No. But um, it seems so there's, there's an implication it might. Okay. Sporothyrox chinchii, what does this cause? Where are you going to see Sporothyrox chinchii? Where, we, where did you see this, uh, the one I just talked about? I don't want to go back to it and get the answer away. Where did you see Sporothyrox chinchii? Hmm? People that does what? Landscaping. Landscaping, exactly. You're going to find it on rose thorns. You find it in other places, but what do we call it? What else do we call it? Rose picker's disease. Exactly. You're going to see ulceration near the side of the prick, and then it will uh, can go internally past that. Okay. Talked about aspergillus. Talked about the. Let me let me get to another one here. Um, talk about some of the superficial mycoses, right? Pedro, what was that one? That's the nodules in the hair. What are the two types of that? Black and white. Okay. Pediasis, it's uh, flakiness on the skin, both from a fungal infection. But superficial, before we start getting more into this, what do you mean by superficial? It's on the what? The outermost part of the skin. Okay, we've talked about some cutaneous mycoses. Okay, so what would you call um, jock itch? What's the name for that? Jock itch. Tinea. Tinea. Bless you. Chalk itch. Hmm? Crucis? Yes. Okay. What do you call fingernails? Tinea. Unguum. Okay. Now, when I'm saying all these tinnias, am I naming a specific fungus? I said this, I was very specific about this. Am I naming a fungus that causes this? Is tinea unguum a fungus? No, it is not. It is a condition caused by one or more fungi. So it's, it's not a particular genus species of fungus. So don't, when you see the words, don't think genus species. This is not a genus and species of, of fungus. Okay. Ringworm, what's that one? Tinea ringworm. It's not really a worm, it's a fungus, but ringworm on the body, fungal infection on the body, cutaneous mycoses. Tinea, Latin for body, porous, yes. Okay. Now, these are the di now, are you responsible for knowing all the different fungus that can cause this? No, you are not. But again, the point is the tinea, whatever, is not a particular genus and species of fungus. Okay, this, these are the fungus that can cause that. Okay. Oh, that's what I want to ask about. Tinea capitis, what can that cause? What can that cause? Tinea capitis. T 
tinea capitis. Hair, hair, loss of hair in splotchy locations, in, in different locations. Is that baldness like, you know, Patrick Stewart baldness? No. It's not, it's not like Patrick Stewart baldness, not like Captain Jean-Luc Picard. It's more like splotches of hair loss. So that's what I mean by hair loss here. All right. Again, you should know each of these forms of fungal infections, uh, cutaneous fungal infections. Okay. We talk about candida albicans a lot, so definitely know about candida albicans, yeast infections are going to be the primary thing, and thrush would be the cause of that. Okay. All right. On this one, I'm, I'm going to send an email about this. Um, I am not going to put on the media on this one. And the reason is, I was going to have, my plan was to do the media in um, lab, and then you could see the results. But if you don't have a chance to see the results, then I can't really test you on it. At least I wouldn't test you on it. I'm not going to test you on a PowerPoint of media. You haven't seen it. So uh, the media part will be on the next test. Okay, so um, next week on Tuesday, you're going to see the different selective and differential medias. You're going to see all of them work. So uh, then I can test you on that. All right. Any, let's see. Now we have... Okay, that, that, we talked about that on the last test. All right. Talked a few about parasites here. Okay, Lemicoides, where do you usually see this one? Is it widespread? Is it not widespread? What do you say? Lemicoides. You see this one a lot of places, or is it really rare? It's pretty common, actually. Um, 10 to 15% of the population is infected by it. Point is here that it can cause de a delay in development. Um, I didn't show some of the pictures, but it can, it can come out the nose. It can come out the anus at uh, different times. It's a, it's a fairly nasty thing. But, you know, the sad part here is it's so common in poor countries that, you know, they, they're the ones that can least afford the effects of this. We already talked about Draconis. Loa Loa, the one that gets in the eyes, right? We talked about that one. Ricularis, what was that one? Causes what? Pinworms. If you've ever been a parent, you have to take a piece of tape and, you know, pull that one out. All right. Tesoplasma gondii, that causes what? It can cause, well, bipolar, yes, and possible, well, and we know for in females, it can cause, not depression, it cause depression, and what else, why do they tell people, why do they tell women not to change cat litter? Because it has this uh, parasite in it, but what does it cause in women who are infected by it, possibly? Miscarriage. Miscarriage, correct. Right. Trichinose vaginalis. Who, who, with uh, vaginalis, who's usually the carrier? Okay, so who's going to be a carrier who does not show symptoms but can transmit it to other people? Males. Who, you, who usually has the symptoms, like uh, urination, pain during urination? 
females. Okay. Now, this can be a problem. No symptoms can be the worst because there can be some long-term effects of the sterility being one of them. So uh, there can be a problem with uh, this in men, too. So just because men are not showing symptoms, it's not a good thing because they, there can be long-term uh, downside to this. All right. Cryptosporidium. Where you, where's cryptosporidium a problem? Where, where would you worry about a cryptosporidium infection? Would you, would you worry about it um, in a nursery? Probably not. Water. water, municipal water supplies. We get a cryptosporidium infection, and they will um, uh, spread you know, to thousands, tens of thousands, in some cases hundreds of thousands of people. Um, you'll hear, of, not every time, but sometimes you'll hear a boil water request, possibly but from a cryptosporidium. I'm not saying all of those requests come from a cryptosporidium, but if there was one, that would be one suggestion they would give, or just drink bottled water. Okay. Now, you're not responsible for the cases we talked about, you know, 370,000 in Wisconsin. point I'm trying to make is that it can affect hundreds of thousands of people. When there is a cryptosporidium infection in a municipal water supply, the effects are pretty, pretty significant. Okay. Jeremy Lamblia, what's that one? Fever. Fever? Yeah, yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, it, it is that. It causes what? What does it cause? Do you feel, do you feel like a little, a little queasy? Do you feel a little sick? Diarrhea. Diarrhea. It's significant, explosive, like, you know, <laughs> significant diarrhea. Um, where, 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 how would you catch it? Why is it called beaver fever? Why, what, what's a possible vector? Beavers are, you know, river rats, you know, large mammals around water supplies. Okay. So what, what, how's the transmission thing for this? Beaver, whatever, is building a dam. It has this, it releases the cyst, okay? And you, you go and you drink some water from a stream. That's one way to get it. Another way is if you clean dishes and it, the cysts get on the plates uh, is another way. Okay, so this is why I probably shouldn't drink um, stream water. Well, there's lots of reasons why. This is one of them. Okay. Okay. Tromposia cruzii, or Chargar's disease, is carried by the Redubian kissing bug. Um, basically, it puts his feces on you, and then this will get into you. But it, it can go internally and cause um, um, uh, issues with the heart and the brain. But this is a major problem in places like Africa. Um, anyhow. Fowler, this is what? Where, where do you see that one? In Fowler. And stagnant water, right? You, the problem is the water is stagnant. Kids go and play in the water, and this amoeba gets into the brain and eventually resides in the brain and causes death. Um, once it gets into the brain, it's pretty much a death sentence. So, but yeah, this summer you'll probably hear about a couple cases of this. Every summer it happens. Um, you know, kids play in stagnant water get some water in their nose somehow, and, and, and then they're dead a few weeks later, or a few days later. So, anyhow. All right, so that would cover that. Now, the viruses, we, we did the review for the viruses last time. But most of it's going to come from the virus part, I would, I would think. So, any questions? Now now's the time for you guys to ask me questions. Any, any, yes? Um, what kind of, how many questions do you I haven't I haven't written the test. I have not written the test, but if, if I had to guess, if I had to guess, I'd say probably seventy percent would come from viruses. If I had to guess. Like, uh, I'm talking about like, like herpes. Herpes. Oh, 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 oh. Okay, um how many would I like specific ones? I'm just like, yeah, what kind of questions? Well, okay, what kind of questions could come from that? Okay, let me throw some questions out here. Um 
form of herpes that is caught by people like doing wrestling matches. Um, NCAA has rules against this. Um, can cover, what happens is one per person has herpes on their face and it rubs up against the other player's skin. Herpes what? Gladiatorium. Matt herpes is another name for it um, as well. Okay. Another kind of question. What ganglia holds um, what ganglia holds oral herpes? So the oral herpes, you know, around your mouth, right? What what ganglia would hold that? We name we name a specific nerve that would hold this. It brings the T, correct. Trigeminal. Trigeminal nerve. Um, just the oral and the um, Genital herpes. And then what holds it for genital herpes? Sacral. Correct. Um, do you have to know the percentages for populations? No. Um, would I say what's the percentage of Caucasian females that have herpes? I would not ask that. But I could ask what's the relative infection rate of males versus females of herpes. For every one case of males, there's how many of females? About two. Okay, but you don't have to memorize those numbers. Um, I put them just to kind of make a point that there is difference in, in things. And the other thing here is it's a health concern. What kind of virus has a higher infective rate because of herpes? HIV. Quadruples the risk of HIV infections. So, um, somebody asked me about this semester. I had put some like racial groups in those. It, it's the, the CDC keeps track of that. It's it's of concern because you know if, if you have something that quadruples the risk of HIV infection, you know you need to, you need to keep track of who who has the the virus. All right. Um, what else would I ask? Oh, how about this? HHV1, HHV2, true or false? HHV1 causes all oral herpes and HHV2 causes all genital herpes. False. It's about 90-90% of each, but um, most genital herpes are HSV or HHV1, or excuse me, HHV2. Oral herpes are mostly HHV1. Okay. You don't need to know the 90%. I put the percentages. You don't need to know the percentages, but know that most are caused, but not all. You can catch... Uh, oral herpes from a genital herpes infection. Okay. Someone said that, some people say, oh no, I got genital herpes, you won't catch oral herpes, or vice versa, and that's, that's just not correct. All right, um, but yeah, those are the kind of questions I would have on that. Yeah, you're going to ask about the rotavirus. I could ask about rotavirus, <laughs> correct. About how many people are killed every year from rotavirus? About half a million. If I asked about it, I would say something, and, and you might see a different number on the test because if you look up World Health Organization numbers, it's going to vary year to year. But I might say something like, rotavirus causes death. 40, 400, 4,000, 400,000 deaths. Point is, I guess I just want you to know, rotavirus, which is a virus that maybe a lot of you had not heard about before coming in here, kills half a million kids a year. So, to me, it's uh, something to something to be noteworthy of. And, and rotavirus, what's the, what? What does rotavirus cause? Diarrhea, extreme diarrhea. So, um, diarrhea to the point where it's, it's basically just letting out water. So that, that with rotavirus, what would be the treatment? I, of IV, exactly. IV replacement, water, fluid replacement via, via IV. Um, but, you know, third world countries, just, they just don't have that. And prevention, how does it, how, what's the transmission on that one? Sanitation. Sanitation. Well, fecal oral. Um, and sanitation here is an important one. If, they, if you don't have clean water to wash your hands, you know, that is a problem. Uh, let's talk about some other viruses we talked about. Um, 
Okay, this virus causes flu, stomach flu. Um, it's a naked virus. Um, we mentioned an example where there were some soccer players that had an infection of this. I could take two, two terms for this one. It's named after a particular place in the United States. It's one name of it. Norwalk or... Norwalk would work here, yes. Norovirus and Norviridae, yes. Yeah. So both, both of those would work here. Major, major, major problem of uh, uh, sickness. Um, wager to bet that most of us, probably all of us have had one of these. This is the virus, right, that can get into food on cruise ships. And if you hear about a cruise ship that's gone out to sea and then everyone's become sick, it's almost always from a Norwalk virus. Or it's often from that. I don't want to say it's almost always, but it's often from that. Okay. Um, virus that travels via retrograde transport. It goes up the neuron into the central nervous system. Starts in the peripheral nervous system, goes up. Bullet-shaped virus is another clue. It can cause fear of water. It can cause foaming at the mouth. Rabies, correct. Can you survive rabies? If you have a full-blown infection? Yeah, 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 well, a couple years ago, the answer would be no. Now the answer is yes, but there's a little asterisk next to that because it's not a, it's not a pretty recovery. So, um, at least the case I'd read about, the, this young girl, she had a full case of regard to the central nervous system, and she basically had to learn how to walk and talk and do things, and then even her, her learning was somewhat uh, delayed. So... Um, you can live, but it's not a it's not a full recovery. They yeah, basically have to induce a coma for for a long period of time. Okay, um, what other viruses did we talk about? We talked about herpes. We talked about uh, Norwalk. We talked about influenza. You guys know it now. I know we talked about it a lot yesterday. Are you clear on antigenic shift and antigenic drift? We're clear on that one. Okay. Avian, oh, I know what we talked about. Oh, gosh, I know what we talked about. Okay, virus that is basically a very, well, it's not very common. It was seen primarily in the Middle East. Uh, recently, there was a case, well, last year was a case in Spain, and now we're starting to see cases in the United States. Possibly people that are catching this and that have not traveled to the Middle East in the United States. What virus am I thinking about? Seen in the news. MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, correct. Um, the PowerPoint slides on that one are a little off because I did that last semester, and last semester, listen how fast it's changing, last semester, the only case outside the Middle East was in Spain, and that was a woman traveling from the Hajj back to, to Spain. But since then, we have cases in the United States. And MERS is part of what greater group? What group of viruses? What group of viruses? Coronaviridae. Coronaviridae. What's the other one in this one? Another coronaviridae virus caused, um, I don't want to say pandemonium, but caused a kerfuffle, caused a big situation in Asia in the early 2000s. Um, this is the one where I mentioned that China actually had a shoot to kill order in part of their quarantine. They never had to exercise that, but um, that order was there. Uh, Shut down parts of Taiwan, parts of um, China was shut down from this. What am I thinking about? SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome. And how does that usually present? Like what? Pneumonia. Okay. Talk about that one. What other virus are we talking about? We talked about specific influenzas. Are we terror? Okay, um, avian flu. Are we terribly worried about that one, or what's the problem with the avian? Yes, yes and no. It's, it's, the transmission is a little bit hard on the avian, but its fatality rate is somewhat high. So the worry is if its transmission becomes easy to transmit but keeps the same fatality rate, it would be, it would be a problem. Okay, I don't, we did not cover polio, did we? No, that was, that's a pretty good virus to actually talk about, um, but we, we didn't cover that one. Um, I 
think what other viruses we let me let me make sure we got all the viruses we talked about here. Come on. I can do it. Okay. I went through these fairly rapidly. If I have the um, the you know the if it's double stranded or single stranded, all that, don't worry about that. That was just to make a point. Uh, Norwalk, Norwalk. We talked about Norwalk. Oh, here's we talked about this one. Rubella. What does that cause? German measles. What's the, uh, has, this, has this virus been eradicated in the world? No, has not been eradicated in the world. Effectively has been eradicated in the United States. Well, matter of opinion, we have about five to ten cases a year. So, technically no, but when you compare rates before and after the MMR shots, I mean, we, we showed the, we showed the um, chart here, right? The late 60s, you're talking about 50 to 60,000 cases a year. There's been such a dramatic decrease that the uh, book had actually um, made the chart smaller to have a little cutout because there's like 5 to 10 cases, 20 cases a year currently. So, you know, going from 10 cases a year from 60,000 cases is pretty dramatic. Okay. Correct, correct. Okay, we talked about, uh, the, the reason is this is from my um, health micro class, we talked about all of the viruses, but I just want to pick out some of the more important viruses that made a point, a greater point about viruses in general, like, you know, shift and drift, stuff like that. Or that were ones that I think, you know, you should just know just generally uh, speaking. Um, and I pulled out, like, the rubella because of the DNA change, and we made the point about DNA and cancer, that viruses are affecting us on a genomic level. So um, just, just to make some points we talked about before. Um, so we talked about coronavirus, SARS, right? We talked about rabies. What, what's the primary carrier for rabies? Bats. Now, if you look at different parts of the country, raccoons will be in one area, it's more of a carrier in other places, other carriers. Um, like for example, in the south, a raccoon would be the more carrier, and then in the Midwest, you're, the skunk would carry it more. But overall, cats are going to, bats are going to carry it um, mostly. If you looked at, if I if I showed you a map of this with bats, you'd see a bunch of dots over it. Basically, it's, it, the entire country would be carried by bats. So, um, very common transmission on that. All right, and you're not responsible for knowing like the specific, you know, raccoons in one area and the other. Just know that bats carry the majority of this. Okay. We talked about Marburg. We talked about that one. I believe that's the only ones that we had. There's a lot of interesting viruses here, but you know, it's it's. Oh, here's the one we talked about: influenza, right? What is the what's what's on the outside of this one? What 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 two things that we use to characterize influenza? Mm. Yes. Amidase, that yes. Okay. The reason that's important is because, well, they have a function with the virus. Okay, but they're also important for what? Typing the virus, right? You've seen the news, you know, they'll say this H1N1 or whatever. The H and N is referring to that. Okay. And I'm not going to go over antigenic shift and drift because I think you got that point um, fairly well. No, Justin. Okay. 
in Spanish flu, what, what was, okay, let's talk about some of the points here. What was Spanish flu? What was the thing with that? Yes, it's the one that killed Edward. What else? Killed to, uh, exactly, killed millions of people during World War I. Um, millions. I mean, it, it technically it was not decimation, but it was close to decimation. Um, okay. Uh, avian flu, H5N1, that's the one that what? Transmission has high fatality, but transmission is somewhat difficult on that one. But the worry is that that one's going to jump and somehow become easier to transmit. Um, the flu season, what was that a great example of? Not working because of what phenomena? Antigenic? Shift. Shift. Right? Okay. Okay, and then last one on this, we talked about rotaviruses, again, diarrhea. No, uh, do you have to know exactly 600,000? No, but if you saw a number in the hundreds of thousands versus a thousand versus a hundred, know that it's in the hundreds of thousands. And again, the, the numbers vary on this per year. Okay. Has anyone heard of fifth disease? Fifth disease? Possibly? Okay, never mind. Okay. And then we talked about herpes, right? Nova ganglia that it is, the trigeminal nerve for oral herpes, the sacral ganglia nerve for the um, genital herpes. Neonatal herpes. What are some points on neonatal herpes? It's, it's babies, right? How, how can you catch neonatal herpes? How can an infant carry catch this? They have an outbreak during pregnancy. An outbreak during pregnancy. Also can be transmitted in vivo in the egg, so to speak. Uh, it can be transmitted before birth. It can be transmitted during birth. And what's the other way of transmitting this? After birth, you know, touching, kissing a baby, and that person has oral herpes. So that's also been known to transmit this. Um, is this is this bad or is this what? Is it just going to pass? It, 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 exactly. It can cause death in many cases depending on how far it gets. If it gets the central nervous system and onward it, it can actually cause a significant death rate. Okay. Uh, what's the treatment? And what, let's, say, let's say a female has this. What, what are the options? C-section or what else? Uh, antivirals right before birth and Hope that um, those will keep the um, infection tamped down and not come out and you know, cause open things. Now, there can be a problem, obviously, that if a female catches this, it's subclinical, but it can pass. So if a female has this but does not know it at the time of birth, um, let me say that if a female catches herpes while pregnant, okay, and she might not test positive for herpes, but she can transmit it to her child. So... Okay, we didn't talk about chicken pox, shingles, that's an interesting one, Epstein-Barr, that's actually a very interesting one, smallpox. Okay, um, then I think that has pretty much wrapped it up, guys. Any questions? Is there anything specifically that we need to be able to draw? Induction would definitely be one you should be able to draw. Um, like shift and drift? Shift and drift, possibly, yeah. Shift and drift would be one you could draw. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Uh, oncogene, part of oncogene. You should be able to draw that. The next test we had, there was a question on that. So yeah, there's a few things you should be able to draw. What about the types of fungi? Like the, um, the like five types. On the oh, oh, would I have a list where you'd have to describe all those? No, no, no. But I could ask you a specific question, like what group of those is has most human pathogens? Sacker, Escamasi. So yeah, I could ask a question like that. But if I'm going to say, would I say a question, 
give all groups of fungus? No. No. Sure not. Surely not. All right. So I guess that wraps us up. Uh, we'll see you guys uh, Tuesday. Uh, probably on Wednesday. That's probably we're going to have the lab final. What, what's going to happen in lab is I'm going to... Um,